So I know it's the very last day and it's before lunch. So I want to start with the movie. So this is a box. So if you, uh, this is the corner of the box. This looks like a hexagon, but if you look at it for a little bit, you can realize it's a box. So this is the top back corner of the box. This is the front. This is the top of the box. This is the bottom of the box. Okay. So in the box, we're trying to represent uh, neutrino fields. Uh, neutrino fields like you might see above a supernova remnant. Neutrinos, electron neutrino field, um, electron antineutrino field, and a, a nu X field. But that's, that's not what's represented here. So what's represented here are little tiny fluctuations. So the actual number densities of neutrinos are taken from a simulation that uses Boltzmann transport and doesn't worry about the quantum nature of the neutrino. And so on top of that, little tiny quantum fluctuations are added on the off diagonals of, um, uh, well, effectively the density matrices. Okay. So if I can play the movie, here's what happens to these little density fluctuations. Okay, so this is the phase. So you're looking at the phase of the, of the neutrino field. And uh, Ray Sawyer isn't here, but this is uh, the thing he talked about all the time. This is fast flavor oscillations happening above, uh, uh, at least happening if you start with the field that's predicted to be above a neutron star merger. And uh, so I'm excited about that. And I'm even more excited because this is not lots of little neutrinos, but this is lots of moments of the neutrinos. So this is, the field is represented at every point by an energy moment and a flux moment. So the flux moment has three parts for the three different directions, X, Y, and Z. And all of these are, are matrices. Okay, so let me play it one more time. And uh, if you're a fast flavor aficionado, you see the first you have the growth phase and then you have saturation. And this is what happens after saturation. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to talk about why you would want to do such a simulation. I'm going to try to motivate this with uh, nucleosynthesis. Talk a little bit, just a little bit, motivate the, uh, how the simulation is set up. And then I'll talk about a little bit about physics that you could extract from it. So I'll put this down and start with the talk. Okay, so, so my original topic that I was given was survey of neutrinos and nucleosynthesis, and I, I narrowed it to some topics in neutrinos and nucleosynthesis. Okay, so I just said I'm gonna try and motivate uh, looking at neutrino flavor transformation above a supernova, of a, above a neutron star merger. So, I just want to set the stage to get you to think about what the environment is like. So this is, a, this is an artist rendering of a neutron star merger. But over here, we have a cartoon of what a remnant might look like. So this is the accretion disk. You have to imagine this goes out of the page at you. This is the hypermassive neutron star. These are lots and lots of neutrinos that we are also interested in being emitted from the hypermassive neutron star in the accretion disk. And these red regions are regions of outflow. So you have all this material being ejected from this disk and it's being irradiated by the neutrinos. Okay, so mostly I'll talk about nucleosynthesis, but first of all, I just want one slide to make the point that this is not the only reason that we care about neutrinos or neutrino flavor in neutron star mergers. So Neutrinos have so they have a substantial part of the energy of the object. And so they're a very important player in determining how the neutron star evolves. So you have two, uh, the merger evolves. You have two neutron stars spiraling in. You might form a black hole in a torus. You might find out, form a hypermassive neutron star, an accretion disk, or a supermassive neutron star and be left with a supermassive neutron star. And neutrinos are very important in this evolution. But now I want to quickly move on to element synthesis. 
Um, there are four places within a neutron star merger, roughly categorized, where you could make elements. So you have the two neutron stars spiraling in, and some material gets ejected off the side. And you also have some material that gets ejected from the conduct interface. These things are called collisional ejecta. And then uh, after the remnant forms, you have material that leaves the sides here of the accretion disk. That's the viscous evaporation. And you also have material that gets blown off in a neutrino driven wind. Okay, so there are some specific examples of questions where you need neutrino physics to understand what is going on here uh, with, this, with these elements. So I think you're all aware that uh, we think some of our process material comes from a neutron star merger, but we don't know if all the R process material in the galaxy comes from neutron star mergers. The R process, what we see here in the solar system, we don't know if that's come from a neutron star merger or not. And we know some of the elements neutron star mergers make, but not all of the elements. Okay, so I just, I just wanna continue to motivate why neutrinos are so important. And I'm going to draw on data from astronomy. So this is a beautiful slide that I have stolen from Dan Kaysid that shows the electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave signal of uh, merging neutron stars. And the dots are constructed from the data. This is bolometric luminosity, and this is time, okay? And then there are these two curves. There's the blue curve and the red curve, okay? So you have energy in the ejecta, and those photons need to scatter out of the ejecta. And if they're very effective at scattering, you get the blue curve. And if they're less effective, you get the red curve. Okay, so the red curve is material that has higher opacity. And it turns out that because of the electronic structure of lanthanides, lanthanides have higher opacity. So this is evidence that you have made lanthanides in a merger. Okay, so where, where are, what are the lanthanides? Okay, so if I make a plot of abundance or amount of stuff, amount of elements versus atomic mass, I have all these features in it. And this bump here is the lanthanides. We call that a nucleosynthesis, we call it more the rare earth peak, but it's pretty much overlapping with the lanthanides. And um, over here, this is what's called the third peak. This is where the golden platinum is. And this is called the second peak. And this is the third peak. And this structure comes from the rapid neutron capture R process. So the evidence is for this right here. Okay, so the R process, the R process is a rapid neutron capture process. So you start, often you start in free neutrons and protons, and then you make some nucleus, and then you capture neutrons. So you capture neutrons, and then you beta decay, capture more neutrons, and so on. This is in the ZM plane. And you can see that the more neutrons you have, you're always going to be able to beta decay if you're off stability. The more neutrons you have, the more blue lines you can make going over, and the heavier nuclei you can make. Okay, so the more neutrons you have, the further you get up here in A, and that translates to going further to the right on this plot, okay? So the evidence is that you had enough neutrons to get out here, okay? It's not, we don't necessarily know from that whether you got out here or out here. Okay, so um, it turns out that nuclei are more important than just in, as an opacity source in the ejecta. So the energy that you, are, you have that produces the photons that you need to use to scatter out, that comes from nuclear heating. So it can be useful to think of this in, in, in two separate stages. There's a first stage that happens, you know, a couple seconds where you have all of this rapid neutron capture 
and you make nuclei however far you're going to make, either to lanthanize or past that, whatever you're going to do. And then there's still, at a day or so, there's still a bit off stability. There are no more neutron capturing going on, but they have to continue to decay a little bit. And it's that decay that is producing the energy and the photons that need to, that need to scatter out. So it's not just the opacity, it's also the nuclear heating from those decays. And I had the great pleasure to work with Jenny Barnes, who is a, who is a postdoc here at the KITP. And what I learned from that collaboration as, is that the amount of lanthanides, it does, it does matter when you have very few lanthanides, but uh, as far as changing that curve. But after you get above a certain threshold, that is no longer the major effect. But after you're above a certain threshold, the major effect is in which nuclei are decaying and often which processes. So beta decay, alpha decay, fission. So if you look at different, um, if you look at different models, different nuclear models, but also models with different amounts of neutrons or different YE, then you will get different predictions for the heating. And those different predictions for the heating will translate into different predictions for what your luminosity should be. And they can be actually pretty significantly different. Okay, so the, the actual nuclei and the nuclear decays, they matter, okay? So you can say, well, are there any nuclei that are particularly critical? So here's an example of one that is particularly critical. This is really heavy compared to the lanthanides. Lanthanides are around mass number 160. This is mass number 254. And you can see that if you look at the heating without the Californium 254, you get this dotted line here. But if you look at all the heating, including Californium 254, then you get the red line. So it's a pretty significant perturbation on the heating. And then that becomes a lifting of your luminosity at late time. Okay, so I don't have a picture of it right now, but uh, astronomers have gone to look for this, and at least so far they haven't found it. Okay, so there have been measurements of the relevant region. It hasn't been found. I wouldn't count that as a non-detection, but more as a hint, perhaps. And so what does that mean uh, if, that, if that is correct that you didn't have Californium 254, which I, as I said, is more of a disfavoring and not a, a, a solid statement, then you didn't get out here to very heavy nuclei, but you did get here, okay? So you got somewhere in the middle, probably, okay? So, um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a question we'd like to know, where are we? Also, it's a nice sensitive test of weak interaction physics because how do you determine how many neutrons you have? Well, it comes from the weak interaction. Okay, so this is extraordinarily similar to things that George said. <laughs> the weak interaction really matters, okay? Um, and, and interestingly, if you look at this from the point of view of making elements, this is hugely different. Either you just make the lanthanides or you get out all the way out to California, there's a whole lot of elements in there, but it's actually very small changes in the neutrino physics or the weak interaction physics that will make that difference between the lanthanides and the, um, the lanthanides in Californium 254. But anyway, your neutrinos will capture on neutrons and make protons and antineutrinos capture on protons and make neutrons, and these reactions can also go in reverse. And this tells you how many neutrons and protons you have to start with, which if you're making a model tells you how far you're gonna get. Are you, are you gonna get, is your, first is your model good enough to get to the lanthanides? But if you have a really good model, it will tell you, make a prediction for where you are in between the rare earth and Californium. Okay, so this is what I said. This matters a lot, okay? So this is, uh, this was a former student of Baja, 
um, and uh, Rebecca that I had the good fortune to collaborate with. And these are different, these is uh, results of element synthesis from an accretion disk around a black hole. And this is different, the effect of having different neutrino spectra. And you can get from anything from all the way out to Californium to being stuck over at nickel over here. So it really matters. Okay, but again, I will say the same thing George said, is that it's really only electron neutrinos and electron antineutrinos at these energies that will convert neutrons to protons. You don't have enough energy in these uh, neutrinos to make muons. So if you have an oscillation between an electron neutrino and a muon neutrino, you are changing the effective rate of this interaction, okay? And mergers in general have less mu's and tau's than they have nu e's and nu e bars. So any oscillation is in fact reducing your power to do either this reaction or this reaction, depending on what's oscillating. Okay. Okay. So the next question is: Well, that's all very nice that the that uh, that you you can see that if this happens, it'll be important. But does it happen? Okay. And I think the whole community agrees that yes, this does happen. Now you can argue about exactly how it happens and what the process is, but I don't know anybody who is suggesting that the neutrinos do not oscillate in mergers. And so here is an example of what I mean. You have a, this is a blacked out hypermassive neutron star and accretion disk, that's the remnant of the Brodo neutron star. And here's a neutrino that you launch at some angle and then it starts off as an electron neutrino that's red, and then it converts somewhere and becomes a muon neutrino. So one of our jobs is to figure out what is going on there. And uh, to do this, I just have a couple preparatory slides. So you can think of neutrinos, you can cast them in the form of a density matrix here. And once you do that, you can solve, you can in principle, <laughs> solve the quantum kinetic equations where you evolve the density matrix according to both the Hamiltonian and the collisions. Okay, so now I'm going to promptly drop the collisions and just look for the moment at the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has these three pieces and this piece over here is the one that causes us all the problems, the neutrinos interacting with the other neutrinos. Now, if you are, you can think of these as, of course, you have to solve this exactly if you wanna know what happens, but if you just wanna guess what might happen where, you can think of these things broadly as scales, okay? So that's what the next picture is, thinking of these things as scales. So this, this green line is a vacuum scale. This is the other vacuum scale. The blue line is the MSW Hamiltonian scale. And the light blue line is the unoscillated self-interaction scale. And so when do interesting things happen? Well, the MSW effect, as you all know, happens when the uh, matter scale is about the same as the vacuum scale, just like it does in the sun and in the outer layers of the supernova. The collective effects, which here is labeled as the mutation region, that interesting scale is actually right before the, uh, this neutrino potential hits the vacuum potential right here. If I back up even farther, I have an interesting uh, collision of scales between the the neutrino Hamiltonian and the matter Hamiltonian here and here. And this gives rise to a matter neutrino resonance transition, okay? And then we have our bigger problem, which was the movie I showed in the beginning, which is this fast flavor region. And this is also a scale effect. So when you have, when you have perturbations in your neutrino field that are roughly the same scale as the as the Hamiltonian, the neutrino Hamiltonian, you can get that effect. So you have all these ways in which your neutrinos can flavor transform. And you have to decide 
what is happening. So for the most part, I'm gonna talk about this one, but very briefly, I'll just say something about these two here. If you manage to avoid the fast flavor transformation, you can either have a collective effect, just like George and Huayu showed all those years ago in the supernova, it happens here in a merger, or you can have a matter neutrino resonance effect, which is something I was lucky enough to work on with Alex and Annie some years ago. And one of the points of this slide is that it's very sensitive. What happens here is very sensitive to the neutrino fields. So this is actually the same point in space above a neutron star merger. But this one just took the data straight out of a neutron star merger simulation. And this one, to get this one, we first tried to correct the neutrino fields to take into account additional scattering that happened above the uh, merger remnant that was not taken into account in the original simulation. And you can see that what happened there is just by changing the angular distribution of the field somewhat subtly, you went from collective oscillations to a whole different type of oscillation that happened somewhat earlier. Okay, so I have to be somewhat careful. Okay, and so now I would like to move on to the difficult so-called fast flavor transformation. Okay. And uh, Ray Sawyer is in here, but he is the one that was telling us for years that we should look at uh, fast flavor transformation. And there are many people in the audience that have contributed to this problem, either directly by working on fast flavor transformation or in other capacities, for example, looking at the applicability of mean field or quantum entanglement or looking at direct uh, the detection of neutrinos. So the general consensus is that you can get this type of transformation when you have two things. The fastest of the fast flavor transformations happens when your fluctuation wavelength in the neutrino field is similar to the difference in the number densities between the fields. So you want, would like something like this. And then there's also this criterion that there's a crossing. Okay, so what, what is a crossing? Okay, so this is a, a difference in number density. I think it's really occupation number between neutrinos and antineutrinos at some point above a binary neutron star merger. And you can see that sometimes it's negative indicating that in some directions, this is direction here. So maybe I should say a little more. So you have your, you have your um, hypermassive neutron star, you have an accretion disk, you're sitting at some point here above it. And then at that point, you're, you sort of measuring the neutrinos, maybe measuring is the wrong word, but you're looking at the direction of all the neutrinos and you're looking at the relative numbers of neutrinos in each direction. And this is the subtraction of those two. So over here at this point, if you look at some angles, you see more antineutrinos than neutrinos. At some other angles, you see more neutrinos than antineutrinos. And the fact that this goes through zero is a crossing. And in this case, there are two such, at this point, there are two such places, okay? Okay, so you can think, uh, there are many ways to consider um, where there's a crossing, this is just one way. This is a simulation by uh, Francois Focar, and uh, this is a Boltzmann transport, no quantum neutrinos, but you can look at the width of that crossing. So the, 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 how, how much space there, angular space there is between one crossing and another crossing, and you can color code that. And that gives you a, some, that's one way to look at uh, what's going on with the neutrino fields. So this little X here, that is the place where I showed the previous, the point for which the previous plot was shown. There were two crossings there, okay? Okay, so now if we want to analyze flavor transformation, there are many ways that we can do this. So the most popular way is stability analysis. So there's many, many, many papers 
written on stability analysis. And you start with some fields that are in their flavor states, you add some fluctuations, you do a stability analysis, and you try to see what happens. Then there are a lot of other papers that are on toy models, and I was not going to talk about those. There are many, they're very interesting, but because of time, I was not going to talk about those at all. Another thing you can do is particle and cell methods. So you can put lots of neutrinos in a box, not moments like I showed you before, but a bunch of uh, different fields that are supposed to represent neutrinos and you can track everything, okay? Or you can use these more approximate methods. Okay, okay so the first thing I have, I have just one slide on stability analysis because I later I wanna show you um, a Fourier transform of that movie I showed before. And you can see, you have to plot this versus K, which is the fluctuation wavelength. Suppose you have a whole bunch of fluctuations in your neutrino field, you Fourier transform it. You say, oh, look, so some, I have some power on, on this scale. Let me go and consider in my stability analysis whether that leads to growth. And then you can plot how, as a, as a function of K, what you think that initial growth rate should be. And your system, if you evolve it, should grow at the rate of the fastest mode here. Okay, so this is actually not done for that point. This is for a, a supernova, but it's the same idea. So, but that only tells you how fast you think something grows um, and we, after you initially seed it, it doesn't tell you what happens after that. And so this is a plot by uh, Sherwood Rickers, uh, Don Wilcox and Nicole Ford, where they evolve using particle and cell methods, uh, uh, unstable situations, it's the 2 lead method. And one of the things they show in their very nice papers is that the growth continues over many orders of magnitude at the same rate that you initially predict. So this is an analytic prediction and this is the actual growth rate. So that, that's all excellent. It doesn't address Baja's concerns about mean field, but it's still very excellent. Um, but if you would eventually, if, if what you wanna do is you want, if you're interested in using the astronomical measurements uh, to enrich neutrino physics. So you wanna go back and say, well, you know, what elements am I producing? What's going on here? Then um, you're gonna be limited using particle and cell methods. So you have to think because they require a lot of computational time. So you have to think about other ways that you might do this. And a natural way to think about doing this is using moments. And the reason it's a natural way to think about it is because moments are already used in Boltzmann transport. That's the way many supernova simulations are done and the way many uh, binary neutron star merger simulations are done. So the idea is to use some approximate method. Okay. This, uh, of course you have an approximate method and it carries a very substantial numerical risk, okay? And uh, George and Luke and collaborators have shown that this is not a controlled approximation. Okay, you're truncating a tower of moments. You should really keep all of the, all of the moments. Okay, and this is certainly true. It would be better if you could keep all of the moments. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying moment, moment, moment here, but what do I, I just wanna write down what I really mean, okay? So you just integrate over your distribution function that gives you your zero moment, the energy function, or you add in the direct, uh, moment direct, uh, the direction of your momentum and integrate over it and you get your flux or you have two and you get your pressure. Most uh, transport codes have two moments, these first two, which means that you wind up not evolving the pressure. So the pressure shows up in your equations, but you have to find a way to deal with that and not evolve it. Okay. Okay, so back to this point. 
let's uh, give it a try for this point here and see what happens. So now instead of trying to show the movie again, the movie turned out to be too big to, uh, um, to implant in the PowerPoint. So there's are some stills of the movie. This is that point um, on, in a box. This is the uh, initial perturbation or just actually after the initial perturbation. This is during the growth phase. This is uh, when you saturate and this is as you continue to evolve. Okay, this is what happens to the phases. Okay, but the phases, they don't tell you so much about the physics. So what might tell you about the physics is looking at what happens to the number density of electron neutrinos, because after all, that's where we're going, right? We eventually want to know what the, what the neutrino number density is. So what happens when this oscillates? So this is the number density of neutrinos you started with. This is the moment method. You start here, and I should have said, actually, I should have said on the previous slide that these simulations were done by Evan Gross, okay? They were all done by Evan Gross. And uh, you see here that you, um, at first, the, if you're looking at the, uh, the density of electron neutrinos, nothing seems to happen. And then you have this sudden drop. That's the growth phase. And then you, uh, and then you tend to level out. This is the saturation. Okay. So how do you know if you're right? So you're truncating, uh, you have these moments not a controlled approximation. How do you know if you're right? Well, people who do Boltzmann transport have encountered this problem already. And they, they, uh, they use a closure and they also compare to more exact methods. So we copy from them and try to compare with more exact methods. And this is the particle in cell method over here. Mm -hmm. So every place where you have two moments, instead you have 1500 particles in a cell and you repeat the calculation and you see what happens. Okay. So it does not in fact saturate at exactly the same place. However, the way you, the way you, uh, um, the way you truncate is the closure. So one could study the closure and develop a quantum closure. It brings these into better alignment. However, they're really already pretty good. Okay, this is the this is where you have flavor equilibration. So with the particle and cell, you're slightly above particle equilibration, and with the moments, you're slightly below particle equilibration. Okay, I just have one or two more. This is the same plot I just showed you, and this is the off diagonal part. So you can see this tremendous rise here during the growth. And then in the moment method, this tends to get somewhat lower than it does in the particle and cell method. Okay. okay, one more thing you can do, thinking back to the stability analysis, is you can say, well, what fluctuations are growing? Okay, so you can do a Fourier transform um, during the growth phase, a little before saturation, and see what happens. And if you do that, you get the red curve here. So this suggests that this is the peak of the growth. Or you can do it with particle and cell methods. And you can say, well, this is the peak of the growth. So you can see that these, they're not exactly the same. It's an approximate method, but they're really quite close. And if you try to do a linear stability analysis on the moments, you get around here with this green line. Okay. okay, that is all I wanted to tell you about today. So the conclusions are that we need to understand neutrinos in astrophysical systems to accurately predict observations, including the R process. This is going to involve solving the quantum mechanic equations in astrophysical environments. And I uh, showed you a, of a small step in this direction during this talk. And then I also want to make this sort of editorial comment, which is we have these amazing laboratories available to us, the supernova and uh, binary neutron stars. And that, that 
and with that comes extra observables. There's the light curve, there's elements, there's you know gravitational wave signals. And it would be nice to bring that into neutrino physics to really enrich neutrino physics. But we have a lot of uncertainties right now. And one of those uncertainties is in fact in our own toolbox, which is the, the neutrinos, the, the standard model, the regular neutrinos without beyond the standard model physics. So by making progress on these issues, we would do a service to the neutrino physics community to, to get better laboratories and make us better able to bring data from other fields into our field and um, enrich our field. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. No time for questions. Uh, so I have two questions. One is about oscillations. One is about nucleosynthesis. nucleosynthesis. So with oscillations on the figure where you were showing like the different oscillation regimes, you know, fast flavor, MNR, uh, uh -huh. MSW. Yeah. Yeah. So why is there that dip in the neutrino collective potential? I'm sorry, say it again. Oh, there is that oh. dip in the neutrino collective potential. Where because, is... because, um, because of the geometry. So this is where it flips sign. So this is the magnitude of the... Oh, I, I should see. have explained that when I explained the figure. So um, because it's a log scale, I didn't, there's no good way to plot uh, that. So it crosses zero and... Yeah, then... it crosses zero. That's... Okay. And then the other question was about the uh, heating rate from, let's say, like, Californium 254 or other heavy uh, decays of other heavy nuclei. So how important are excited states in those heating rates? And is that like, do we know how much uncertainties are there associated with that? We do not. So, um, so it's, it's pretty, it's very, it's pretty low temperature at a day. So I don't think you have much that's thermally excited, but there's certainly isomers that are hanging around for a long time and these are not included in there. So it, it's an important thing to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Gail, for a very nice talk. Um, I was fascinated by that slide you showed that compared the moment method calculation to the particle and cell calculation for the off diagonal, the quantum coherence uh, uh, density matrix elements. Yeah, that one. So I see there that um, there's a, uh, the particle and cell uh, calculations predict a persistence of that uh, coherence. Yes. That's lost in the moments. And I'm just wondering whether this is related to the features that I mentioned this morning that we find in the moment calculate, the quantum moment calculations which is this cascade of power, transformation power to smaller and smaller, you know, momentum scales, right? So, you know, I don't yeah. know how many moments you put in the calculation here. Just two, just, just two. Just two. So you can see the power here during saturation. I mean, I guess this is this is before saturation. So we could try and make that plot again for Yeah, I just yeah, wondering if you if if yeah. there were more moments in the tower, um, whether you get something closer to the particle and cell. Well, you know, I, if you have an infinite set of moments, then you should reconstruct the particle and cell. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, it's sort of interesting. We also, I didn't have time to talk about it. So I don't, I don't know what would happen is the, but it's sort of interesting because we did these, uh, uh, before we tried this, we tried um, moments, collective oscillations above a bulb. And there, what happens is that the, you have too much coherence with the, um, so for, uh, let me say for almost all cases, it works great. But if you work really hard to try and break it, the way in which you break it is that the, you find scenarios where the neutrinos, when you do multi-angle, lose coherence. But then uh, there's, then, so then you have too much coherence in the moment calculation. So whereas you might get beautiful split, yeah, you might get beautiful splits. And maybe I have a backup slide about that. 
Yeah, here's the backup slide. So this is a two moment bulb and you see, this is our attempt to break the two moment bulb. You see that they both start off transforming the same way, but the multi-angle calculation uh, loses its coherence, but the two moment calculation continues. And you can also see that, you can tell I'm interested in it. <laughs> you can also see that uh, when you look at the spectra, you do the two moment, you have nice spectral splits and you look at the multi-angle and it gets all mushed together. And so that mushing is what you, what you wind up missing. So, you know, as we were talking the other day, it's fun that uh, these days uh, you are taken by the mechanics of collective oscillations and I am mesmerized by nuclear synthesis. <laughs> yes. So there's like a, a, a bipolar oscillation in the field. Uh, I was going to ask you about nuclear synthesis though. So for, yeah. for the geometry of this problem, right? It, 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 it matters in, in first order, whether you're looking for outflow in the disk, right? Some kind of t tidal tails that are ejected or things which go above the disk and maybe even in, in some kind of a jet direction, right? Right. Uh, so these are affected uh, by neutrinos in a, in a qualitatively different way. So when we're talking about these observed yields, right? They're, these two components we have to worry about. So what do we know from observations about the roles of each of these, right? The, the ones so, that are in the, in the plane of the disk versus the, you know, something that could go perpendicular. So that, that is, the way you phrased it is more tricky, but the, um, to answer a slightly different question, you would, you would normally think that that this would be more likely to give you the R process, the stuff that comes, where's my pointer? The stuff that comes off the side here and is less influenced by the neutrinos. But, um, and so then why worry about the neutrinos, just have them make nickel, right? Of course, you would wanna calculate that because we always wanna know what happens in nuclear synthesis. But that would mean, so this, this is, would have a higher velocity and this would have, the a lower velocity but when you when you look at observation you see the opposite that the red has the lower velocity and the blue the which would be non lanthanide has the lower velocity which makes you think that you should really be careful here and and see if you're making our process there does that answer your question do they understand this i mean like the amounts of mass that are supposed to be ejected this way versus this way, average velocities and, 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 and like all of that. And even before you put neutrino oscillations, this already seems like a, a very non-trivial statement about just the, the, the simulation. I think, well, there are simulations and they do predict, uh, I mean, you can look up papers that have, that tell you what your distribution of YE is and how fast right. your ejecta is going. And I think that these, um, these are really excellent papers and I think they also continue to evolve. It's, it's not as the neutron star mergers are not as uh, far along as the core club supernova community. Right, but when people say that we see nuclear synthesis and the, our process, right? What's the kind of baseline model as of today? Is it stuff that goes out above the disk or is it, are, are these uh, things in there? I think it the depends planet? on who you're, who oh, you're talking to. Who you yeah. okay. Other questions or comments? So then let's thank Gail again.